Well, this is a, a thrilling sight and uh, enough to uh, throw the fear of God into any seventh grader <laughs> to see uh, so many teachers assembled uh, in one place. There's something salutary probably about getting together with like-minded people uh, such as yourselves. But there's always something a little eerie about it. Someone pointed out that at conferences like the MLA or the AWP or this one, that you can have the experience of getting on an elevator in a big hotel like this with maybe eight or nine or 10 people and riding down the elevator in silence and realizing that everybody in the elevator knows who Charlotte Bronte is. <coughs> um, which can be a little unnerving. Um, so I'm going to read some poems, and then uh, Richard's going to throw a few questions at me. And I thought I'd begin um, by reading a poem about my reader, since I tend to be fairly reader conscious. And usually I begin a book of poems with a poem of, that's just addressed to the reader as a kind of welcome mat to make the reader aware that I am aware of their presence. I mean, to write, as we know, is an act of hope. You hope someone's going to read it. And... Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> this begins with a, a, a little epigraph from Yeats, um, you know, who, you know, of course, creates modern poetry as the <clears throat> a master craftsman, and yet was no good time in a way. Uh, he uh, often spoke from a certain elevation. He had a very inflated idea of poetry and the role of a poet, <clears throat> and said at one point that the poet never speaks directly as to someone at the breakfast table. And so this poem takes issue with that. It's called A Portrait of the Reader with a Bowl of Cereal. <laughs> Every morning I sit across from you at the same small table, the sun all over the breakfast things, curve of a blue and white pitcher, a dish of berries, me in a sweatshirt or robe, you invisible. Most days we are suspended over a deep pool of silence. I stare straight through you or look out the window at the garden, the powerful sky, a cloud passing behind a tree. There is no need to pass the toast, the pot of jam, or pour you a cup of tea, and I can hide behind the paper and rotate in its drum of calamitous news. But some days I may notice a little door swinging open in the morning air, and maybe the tea leaves of some dream will be stuck to the china slope of the hour. Then I will lean forward, elbows on the table, with something to tell you, and you will look up, as always, your spoon dripping milk, ready to listen. <clears throat> <It's a rather coughs> Thank you. So I'm going to read a few newer poems and then some not so new poems, and you will notice the gradual um, uh, kind of pro uh, progress of develop of improvement as the. <clears throat> as the morning rolls on. Uh, there was a school of poetry called the Graveyard School of Poetry, and this is, uh, could be considered a contribution to it. It's, and it's just called Grave. What do you think of my new glasses? I asked as I stood under a shade tree before the joined grave of my parents. And what followed was a long silence that descended on the rows of the dead and on the fields and the woods beyond, one of the 100 kinds of silence, according to the Chinese belief, each one distinct from the others, and the differences being so faint that only a few special monks were able to tell one from the other. They make you look very scholarly, I heard my mother say, once I lay down on the ground and pressed an ear into the soft grass. Then I rolled over and pressed my other ear to the ground, the ear my father likes to speak into. But he would say nothing, and I could not find a silence among the 100 Chinese silences that would fit the one he created, even though I was the one who had just made up the business of the 100 Chinese silences. The silence of the night boat and the silence of the lotus, cousin to the silence of the temple bell, only deeper and softer, like petals at its farthest edges. 
Um, <laughs> my father used to make up a lot of tall tales, so I thought I would get back at him posthumously. And this is a poem, uh, well, the good news behind the poem is that uh, I went to Sicily a few years ago, and the bad news is I went in August. Uh, <clears throat> and it's about, it's, it was about 40 or 41 degrees Celsius, which if you s divide by 32 and add six, you realize it's really hot. <laughs> and uh, so hot that it changes, uh, it has an effect on your thinking. And the poem is called Palermo. It was foolish of us to leave our room. The empty plaza was shimmering, the clock looked ready to melt. The heat was a mallet striking a ball and sending it bouncing into the nettles of summer. Even the bees had knocked off for the day. The only thing moving besides us, and we had since stopped under an awning, was a squirrel who was darting this way and that as if he were having second thoughts about crossing the street, his head and tail twitching with indecision. You were looking in a shop window, but I was watching the squirrel, who now rose up on his hind legs, and after pausing to look in all directions, began to sing in a beautiful voice a melancholy aria about life and death, his forepaws clutched against his chest, his face full of longing and hope, as the sun beat down on the roofs and the awnings of the village, and the earth continued to turn and hold in position the moon, which would appear later that night as we sat in a cafe and I stood up on the table with the encouragement of the owner and sang for you and the others the song the squirrel had taught me how to sing. <laughs> This is a poem, um, it's called Simile, and it's, uh, I, I think of it as being uh, spoken by uh, a young girl, um, probably someone you know. Simile. When he told me he expected me to pay for dinner, I was like, give me a break. I, I was not the exact equivalent of give me a break. I was just similar to give me a break. As I said, I was like give me a break. I would love to tell you how I managed to approximate give me a break without being identical to give me a break, but the best I can come up with is that I was aware of a certain similarity between me and give me a break. <laughs> and that was okay with me at that point in the evening, even if it meant I would fall short of standing up from the table and screaming, give me a break. For God's sake, will you please give me a break? <laughs> no, for that moment, with the rain streaking the restaurant windows and the waiter approaching, the most I felt I could be was like, to a certain degree, give me a break. <laughs> <clears throat> I have another uh, rather short poem that is also uh, the result of a kind of irritation with uh, colloquial speech. Um, and it's, it's a short poem, it's called, Oh My God. Sometime after I wrote this, I realized that the expression, oh my God, actually has a past tense. The past tense of, oh my God, is, I was like, oh my God. <clears throat> but, you didn't realize that exclamations had tenses until now. But this is simple. Uh, it's just nine lines long, and it's, as you will see, it's um, spoken in the, by a rather naive character. Oh my God, 
not only in church and nightly by their bedsides do young girls pray these days. <laughs> Wherever they go, prayer is woven into their talk <laughs> like a bright thread of awe. Even at the pedestrian mall, outbursts of praise spring unbidden <laughs> from their glossy lips. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. I wanted to uh, I'll read a couple of poems that have to do with writing, um, uh, writing of poetry at least. This is a poem called Monday. It has a very kind of ordinary title because it's about uh, what I take to be sort of the daily habits of poets. If, if, uh, if I'd come across this earlier, I would have thrown it up as an epigraph, but I found it later. It was a comment by Flannery O'Connor, who said, a writer should never be ashamed of staring. There is nothing th that does not require our attention. The poem is called Monday. The birds are in their trees, the toast is in the toaster, and the poets are at their windows. They are at their windows in every section of the tangerine of earth, the Chinese poets looking up at the moon, the American poets gazing out at the pink and blue ribbons of sunrise. The clerks are at their desks, the miners are down in their mines, and the poets are looking out their windows, maybe with a cigarette, a cup of tea, and maybe a flannel shirt or a bathrobe is involved. The proofreaders are playing the ping pong game of proofreading, glancing back and forth from page to page. The chefs are dicing celery and potatoes, and the poets are at their windows because it is their job for which they are paid nothing every Friday afternoon. <laughs> which window it hardly seems to matter, though many have a favorite, for there's always something to see, a bird grasping a thin branch, the headlights of a taxi rounding a corner, those two boys in wool caps angling across the street. The fishermen bob in their boats, the linemen climb their round poles, the barbers wait by their mirrors and chairs, and the poets continue to stare at the cracked bird bath or a limb knocked down by the wind. By now, it should go without saying that what the oven is to the baker and the berry-stained blouse to the dry cleaner so the window is to the poet. Just think, before the invention of the window, the poets would have to put on a jacket and a winter hat to go outside, <laughs> or remain indoors with only a wall to stare at. And when I say a wall, I do not mean a wall with striped wallpaper and a sketch of a cow in a frame. I mean a cold wall of field stones the wall of the medieval sonnet, the original woman's heart of stone, the stone caught in the throat of her poet lover. Thank you. I don't know where any of that came from, but, but especially the ending. Um, and this is a poem called The Trouble with Poetry. Um, it's, don't worry, it's not that long a poem, uh, despite the title. It's not about all the trouble with poetry. <laughs> the trouble with poetry. The trouble with poetry, I realized as I walked along a beach one night, cold Florida sand under my bare feet, a show of stars in the sky. The trouble with poetry is that it encourages the writing of more poetry more guppies crowding the fish tank, more baby rabbits hopping out of their mothers into the dewy grass. And how will it ever end unless the day finally arrives when we have compared everything in the world to everything else in the world? <laughs> and there is nothing left to do then but quietly close our notebooks and sit with our hands folded on our desks. Poetry fills me with joy and I rise like a feather in the wind. Poetry fills me with sorrow, and I sink like a chain flung from a bridge. But mostly, poetry fills me with the urge to write poetry, to sit in the dark 
and wait for a little flame to appear at the tip of my pencil. And along with that, the longing to steal, to break into the poems of others with a flashlight and a ski mask. <laughs> and what an unmarried band of thieves we are, cut purses, common shoplifters. I thought to myself as a cold wave swirled around my feet and the lighthouse moved its megaphone over the sea, which is an image I stole directly from Lawrence Ferlinghetti. <laughs> to be perfectly honest for a moment, the bicycling poet of San Francisco, whose little amusement park of a book I used to carry in a side pocket of my uniform up and down the treacherous halls of high school. I'll follow that with a poem that is um, also involves a certain theft. Um, and, but in this case, instead of just taking an image from Ferlinghetti, I took two lines, uh, the first two lines from a poem I came across in a magazine, a love poem, which I uh, felt I should rewrite. And the, <laughs> this is called Professional Courtesy Among Poets. Uh, <laughs> What was, what was all wrong with this poem, I thought, was that it was, it was a love poem that was filled with nothing but uh, of comparisons, comparing the beloved to uh, everything in nature this fellow could think about. Um, and so it was the convention that uh, is, is as old as the, as, as the sonnet, and, and it should have, uh, Shakespeare tried to put an end to this by saying, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Uh, but the practice continues, and I thought it, it should be corrected since it, re it relies on the assumption that uh, men know what women want, and it's, it's not that they want love or respect or admiration or fidelity or passion. They just want similes. They just want... <laughs> they want to they want be compared to stuff. So... Um, so this fellow begins his poem. You can imagine him looking at the beloved, and he says to her, you are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. Litany. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. You are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. You are the white apron of the baker and the marsh birds suddenly in flight. However, you are not the wind in the orchard, the plums on the counter, or the house of cards. And you are certainly not the pine-scented air. There is no way you are the pine-scented air. It is possible that you are the fish under the bridge, maybe even the pigeon on the general's head, but you are not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk and a quick look in the mirror will show that you are neither the boots in the corner nor the boat asleep in its boathouse. It might interest you to know, speaking of the plentiful imagery of the world, that I am the sound of rain on the roof. <laughs> I also happen to be the shooting star, the evening paper blowing down an alley, and the basket of chestnuts on the kitchen table. I am also the moon in the trees and the blind woman's teacup. But don't worry, I am not the bread and the knife. You, you are still the bread and the knife. You will always be the bread and the knife, not to mention the crystal goblet and somehow the wine. Thank you so much. Um, one of the questions one gets, and uh, I hope it's not one Richard's going to ask me, is, you know, what inspires your poetry? Uh, someone, a po fellow poet, friend of mine, said if he knew where his poems came from, he would go there and not come back. You know? <laughs> so, 
But a lot of the poem, a lot of my poems at this point in my life are, are not so much inspired as the product of a kind of irritation about something. Um, here's an example. Um, it's a it's fairly new, so I I don't have a set title yet. I have the two titles for it. One is uh, migraine, and the other is hangover. <laughs> so you can choose whichever one you're more familiar with. We'll call it for this morning. We'll call it hangover. If I were crowned emperor this morning, every child who is playing Marco Polo in the swimming pool of this motel, shouting the name Marco Polo back and forth, Marco, Polo, Marco, Polo, would be required to read a biography of Marco Polo, <laughs> a long one with fine print, as well as a history of China, and of Venice, the birthplace of the venerable explorer Marco Polo, Marco Polo, after which each child would be quizzed by me, then executed by drowning. Regardless how much they managed to retain about the glorious life and times of Marco, Polo, Marco, Polo. And uh, <clears throat> thank you. Let me read just a couple of. Uh, well, I, w I wanted to read. Uh, I think um, we were. Uh, someone mentioned the the angst in, in teenage poetry, and it's probably the result of writing when you're emotional. And I think all, all young writers um, make, this, make this mistake that they feel that writing is, uh, well, they, they, they believe in self-expression, which is highly overrated, I think. Um, when I was growing up, self-expression was thought of as an affectation of some kind. Uh, and and uh, as Wilfred Sheed pointed out, he said, when I was growing up, we had another name for low self-esteem. It was called humility. <clears throat> it, it was actually a virtue and not a, a psychic dysfunction. Um, but in fact, the best time to write, I think, uh, is when you have a rather blank mind. I mean, Melville uh, called this a kind of grass-growing state of mind where uh, you didn't have... I mean, when you're writing, you don't need to be emotional. You need to concentrate, and emotions tend to be distractions. Well, this is just to say there was a point at which um, I really, I mean, I usually have very little to say, and I reached the point where I had nothing to say, but I didn't want to stop writing. So what I would do is just write a f uh, some nonsense phrase on the top of a piece of paper and then try to construct a poem under it. And here's an example. Uh, the title is Hippos on Holiday. <laughs> Hippos on Holiday is really not the title of a movie, but if it were, I would be sure to see it. I love their short legs and big heads, the whole hippo look. Hundreds of them would frolic in the mud of a wide, slow-moving river, and I would eat my popcorn in the dark of a neighborhood theater. When they opened their enormous mouths, lined with big stubby teeth, I would drink my enormous Coke. I would be both in my seat and in the water playing with the hippos, which is the way it is with a truly great movie. Only a mean-spirited reviewer would ask, on holiday from what? <clears throat> um, well, here's a poem about teaching um, that I wrote some time ago, and it was the result of sitting around with a, a colleague, friend of mine, and we were starting to wonder uh, just out of perverse curiosity, what it would look like if all the students we had ever taught were assembled in one place. I immediately pictured an angry mob. Uh, but we went on to wonder how much would, it, would they fill a, a stadium, or if you line them up, would they stretch from here to New Haven, or how, how could you kind of visualize them all? And um, this was one model of... Uh, one way I visualize them, it's called Schoolsville. 
Glancing over my shoulder at the past, I realize the number of students I have taught is enough to populate a small town. I can see it nestled in a paper landscape, chalk dust flurrying down in winter, nights dark as a blackboard. The population ages but never graduates. <laughs> On hot afternoons, they sweat the final in the park. And when it's cold, they shiver around stoves, reading disorganized essays out loud. <laughs> a bell rings on the hour, and everybody zigzags into the streets with their books. I forgot all their last names first, and their first names last, <laughs> in alphabetical order. <laughs> but the boy who always had his hand up is an alderman and owns the haberdashery. The girl who signed her papers in lipstick leans against the drugstore, smoking, brushing her hair like a machine. Their grades are sewn into their clothes, like references to Hawthorne. The A's stroll along with other A's. The D's honk whenever they pass another D. <laughs> All the creative writing students recline on the courthouse lawn and play the lute. <laughs> Wherever they go, they form a big circle. Needless to say, I am the mayor. I live in the white colonial at Maple and Main. I rarely leave the house. The car deflates in the driveway. Vines twirl around the port swing. Once in a while, a student knocks on the door with a term paper 15 years late. <laughs> or a question about Yates or double spacing. And sometimes one will appear in a window pane to watch me lecturing the wallpaper, quizzing the chandelier, reprimanding the air. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, a little sonnet. Uh, as I said, usually I don't know where I'm going when I begin, and uh, which is really the exploratory thrill. I mean, I think in writing, particularly poetry, that the pen is not so much a recording instrument. I, I don't want to play secretary to my own uh, internal life, but I think of the pen as an instrument of discovery. Uh, William Stafford said, I, I write to find out what I think, uh, rather than, as they say, setting your thoughts down on paper. Um, so, but I sort of knew what I was going to say here, so I turned it into a sonnet. And what I'm reacting to here, I guess it's another bit of irritability, is uh, the kind of outcropping of condo developments and gated communities that you see just about everywhere in this country. And I'm particularly uh, taken with the names of these places, which always sound very rustic, very pastoral, and involve an animal. So they're usually like, you know, Beaver Hollow or Deer Meadow and stuff like that. And it struck me at one point that these are uh, precisely the animals that have been driven out of their habitat um, in order to uh, build these houses. So uh, there's a kind of melancholy undertone to these signs, uh, which are really uh, epitaphs uh, for these uh, creatures. The poem is called The Golden Years. I imagine it being uh, uttered by uh, a retired fellow, a widower, in fact. The Golden Years. All I do these drawn out days is sit in my kitchen at Pheasant Ridge, where there are no pheasants to be seen, and last time I looked, no ridge. I could drive over to Quail Falls and spend the day there playing bridge, but the lack of a falls and the absence of quail would only remind me of Pheasant Ridge. <laughs> I know a widow at Fox Run and another with a condo at Smoky Ledge. One of them smokes and neither can run. So I'll stick to the pledge I made to Midge. Who frightened the fox and bulldozed the ledge? I ask in my kitchen at Pheasant Ridge. Um, OK, so there were many questions submitted, but um, we've got three questions. and if. Here's the first one from one of our writing project folk. What was the most memorable? What was most? What was the most memorable about your experience when you were poet laureate? What stands out? Um, well, lots of things. Uh, 
You do get this terrific office with a view of the Capitol in Washington. You know when you watch CNN and you see the Capitol over the, the guy's shoulder or the woman's shoulder? That's your view. I mean, you sit at your desk and there's the Capitol. But as far as uh, something specific, I think the, uh, the most flattering moment and one of the oddest was when I was, um, I was reading at a high school and there was a signing afterward and um, this high school kid uh, came up to me. It was right, it was during the run-up to the war in Iraq and he said, he asked me, um, he said, how many people would have to die before you become president? And, um, <laughs> and you know, I, <laughs> <laughs> I told them I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't sure, I was quite unsure that I was not in the line of succession. Uh, but then I said, somewhere around 300, you know. Uh, he walked away with a kind of murderous look on his face. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, the next question is, does writing poetry affect other types of writing that you do? And if so, in what ways? Uh, well, they're, they are very different. They're almost like left and right side of the brain for me. Uh, I, I did have a, a student once came up to me after an introduction to poetry class and said, you know, Professor Collins, uh, poetry is harder than writing, uh, which <laughs> I seem like completely <laughs> stupid and yet intelligent in this other way, um, uh, insightful. I don't know. Um, with poetry, I don't know where I'm going. With prose, I seem to have an agenda, um, and it, it became, it's less interesting. The other thing, I think, is that in poetry, I know, I kind of know what I'm doing, uh, at least if it's working. And then every time I write a sentence in prose, and I do this generally because I, I write prefaces. If you want me to write a preface, an introduction, an afterword, a, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of that. Um, and if I write a sentence in prose, I always think there are probably 14 better ways to phrase that. Uh, and th so there's that anxiety of not getting the sentence right or perfect. And in poetry, I'm pretty sure if, if it's a keeper, you know, if I stick with the poem, that that, yeah, that's, that's the way to say it. So, uh, um, and, and also, I, I guess there's not much interference there because they're completely separate acts. And you know, my feeling uh, is that since poetry is superior to prose, uh, <laughs> that I, I'm better off, I feel more at home practicing it. I, I have a kind of ongoing debate with a rather well-known novelist and about um, the, the, the merits of our practice. And I, the last time we talked, I said, well, think of it this way. Just keep something simple in mind. Poetry is a bird, prose is a potato. <laughs> 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 um, finally then, this last question, and this of course fits so beautifully with what you've just done. Do you feel pressure to be funny? <laughs> and do you think your work is changing? Um, no, I never feel the pressure to be funny. I think, uh, it, it, I don't set out to be funny in a poem. It, either it becomes funny or there's something intrinsically funny about it or just my angle of insertion is, it turns out to be humorous. Uh, I mean, you, you, can, uh, you can pretend to be serious, right? In fact, almost all jobs uh, require uh, a degree of that. But you, you can't pretend to be funny. Uh, and and that's, there's, a, there's something, that's, I think there's something crucial about that, that difference. Um, Humor has a very, had a very bad reputation in, 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 in English poetry, uh, at least, ever since the Romantics. A humor, a humor was an integral part of, you know, Chaucer, Shakespeare, the metaphysical poets, uh, Augustine, satire. Um, and then the Romantic poets came along and there was a trade that went on that was uh, unfair and uh, took place behind the scenes. The Romantic poets subs uh, eliminated uh, s both sex and humor from poetry and substituted landscape, <laughs> which is a basically a rotten deal. Uh, <laughs> but now humor has come back. And I think the difference is that the reason humor got a bad reputation was 
it was confused or it was identified with what we call light verse. And in light verse, a poem in light verse wants to be funny from beginning to end. It wants to start funny, maintain humor, and end funny. Whereas the better kind of humor, I think, happens in a poem as a kind of maneuver. I mean, the poem begins serious and then it just gets silly, or it starts out funny and it discovers something that there's nothing to laugh about anymore. It's the way Sean or Casey plays go. He laughs until he just can't laugh anymore, and then the, the tears come. Right? Well, perhaps um, this has been quite wonderful. Perhaps you could leave us with a poem. Um, OK. Um, that sounds like a good way to end. I have a, uh, well, some of you, uh, t uh, some of you uh, teach uh, age groups that are around this period of time, I think. I wanted to, um, um, I wanted to write a poem that made fun of a certain kind of poem, which I would call kind of a midlife crisis poem. That is, po po poems that are written on uh, a poet's birthday, uh, particularly when the birthday ends in a zero. And these are very, uh, um, these are all very depressing poems. <laughs> I mean, you know that the death is the subject of poetry, you know. And if you, if, uh, if you major in if you major in English, you're majoring in death. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's, any time is a good time to write about death. It's like Martha Stewart says: it's good at holiday time or any time. <laughs> Um, but having, the, having one of these uh, uh, cataclysmic birthdays that end in a zero uh, is uh, you're required to write a poem. So I wanted to make fun of all that, um, these poems about on turning 40 and 50 and so on. Uh, and the poem nicely, I think, got away from me. It's called On Turning 10. <laughs> on Turning 10. The whole idea of it makes me feel like I'm coming down with something. Something worse than any stomach ache or the headaches I get from reading in bad light. A kind of measles of the spirit, a mumps of the psyche, disfiguring chicken pox of the soul. You tell me it is too early to be looking back, but that is because you have forgotten the perfect simplicity of being one <laughs> and the beautiful complexity introduced by two but I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was an Arabian wizard. I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. But now, I am mostly at the window, watching the late afternoon light. Back then, it never fell so solemnly against the side of my treehouse, and my bicycle never leaned against the garage as it does today, all the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I say to myself, as I walk through the universe in my sneakers. It is time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends, time to turn the first big number. It seems only yesterday I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I would shine, but now, when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. Thank you.